The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brad DeFries, Program Coordinator at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center, I'd like to welcome you to part one of our three-part Rural Water Resiliency webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Rural Water Resiliency Through Watershed and Roadway Stream Intersection Management, presented by Rebecca Schneider, Associate Professor at the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell University. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to register for parts two and three of the webinar series, which will discuss planning for the latest definition of the waters of the United States and financing resilient communities. The Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center facilitates the development of sustainable and resilient communities throughout U.S. EPA Region 2, across the United States, and internationally. Located at the Syracuse University Center for Sustainable Community Solutions, SUEFC enhances the administrative and financial capacities of state and local government officials, nonprofit organizations, and private sectors to make change toward improved environmental infrastructure and quality of life. I will be providing some technical support for today's session. Please take a moment to observe your GoToWebinar control panel. Most of the functions are self-explanatory, but I'd like to draw your attention to the questions section on your control panel. During today's session, you will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality and minimize background noise. Should you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box. With over 75 registrants for today's webinar, we will try to get to as many questions as time allows, and we'll keep all questions to the end of the presentation. Today's presenter has consented to share her presentation slides with you, and we will make the slides available as well as a video recording following the webinar on the EFC website, efc.syr.edu. Please allow one week for the processing and posting of these materials. With that, I would like to introduce our presenter, Rebecca Schneider. Rebecca's university program focuses on integrated, watershed-based, and sustainable water resource management in the face of climate change. Her research, extension, and teaching all revolve around different facets of this topic. Currently, her primary research program is focused on how networks of roadside ditches that crisscross watersheds contribute to flooding, droughts, and degraded water quality in downstream waters. A second effort is investigating how restore, restoration of organic matter in wetland and terrestrial soils can help to improve hydrologic and biogeochemical functions. Over the past several years, she has worked with students and collaborators and developed a successful research ex extension program that addresses both the theoretical and applied sides of plant-water interactions. The research findings have been translated into several extension programs aimed at improving management of roadside drainage networks to reduce flooding and water pollution, improve watershed management as a buffer against climate change, a sustainable approach to management aquatic weeds, and improving streamside protection. I will now hand over our webinar to Rebecca. Thank you, Brad. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this uh, three-part series. Uh, I'm used to speaking in front of people, so in I can speak very quickly. So if you find I'm speaking too fast, would you please send a note to Brad to slow me down? It is a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about exactly the long title that Brad mentioned, but I've shortened it to watershed-based management to buffer the impacts of climate change. And also because I want you to see really how important this topic is to, at the global level and across the nation, but I also will give you some local solutions. There's four parts to the talk. First, I'm going to just talk about climate impacts on water and then what are natural watershed processes. We're going to focus in on roadside ditches that we've been working on for quite a while and then come back to a comprehensive program for reducing flood risk and what the elements of that should be. First of all, the real issue worldwide is becoming water and arguably it's more important, water scarcity is becoming more important than energy. 
Uh, on the bottom of the slide is a map showing the amount of water available per person per year. And what you see is anything less than around 5,000 cubic meters of water per person per year is either chronically or severely scarce, and already large parts of the world are experiencing that. This past month, an article came out that said there are 4 billion people worldwide who are affected by severe water scarcity for at least one month a year, when you look at it monthly and not overall annually. And so really, it's more than half the world's population are already dealing with water scarcity. And that makes it a critical issue. This is all being exacerbated by climate change. And usually, we focus on the temperatures and the warming, but I'm going to focus on the issue of water, and specifically, how climate is changing the availability of rainfall. And so in the map in front of you, this is a prediction of what will happen to the distribution of pre precipitation around the world in the next decade to so 100 years. And what you see is places that are bluer will have more rainfall, 4, 6, 10, in some places as much as 30 inches or more. But the places that are orange to brown will have less water and become drier. But it's not just the total distribution of water around the world, but how, it, how it's delivered temporally. And so what we will have is actually what we're already experiencing is an increase in the frequency and magnitude of heavy downpours. So the U.S. National Climate Assessment put out in 2013 shows that we are already experiencing an increase in the heaviest downpour rain events. And so in the northeastern United States, we have a 74% increase in the number of heavy rains. And this showed up in an article in the USA Today in May of 2013 when rain, rain won't go away. And in August of 2014, Iceland, Long Island got 13 inches of rainfall in 12 hours and had serious flooding. Two days ago, Houston, Texas got 18 inches of rain. And this is what we mean by this increase in frequency and magnitude of heavy downpours. Conversely, other places are getting longer and hotter droughts, and the most significant one right now in the U.S. is what's been happening to California for the past five to six years. And this is really a serious drought because it may not seem like it's important in the Northeast, but actually California provides about more than 95% of uh, strawberries, broccoli, almonds, a bunch of the produce we depend upon is coming from California. And without water to irrigate and grow those crops, it'll affect things across the whole country. And lastly, some places are getting floods, and then they're getting droughts, and it's going back and forth. And so this is just one example. Here's Missouri in 2015 when it had a serious flood across the state. And then in 2012, three years earlier, it was experiencing severe droughts. And so and one side of looking at this is disaster followed by a different kind of disaster. But by the end of the presentation, I hope you see that perhaps this is not like that. Perhaps we can view it as an opportunity. So in the issue of water scarcity, the climate change is a giant piece of it that's going to be difficult to manage. But the reality is water scarcity has been called a crisis in management, that actually human activities and how we manage water is what has caused the problem. And one of the key pieces of this is that we traditionally have used water, a single river or a single aquifer, for all different types of uses, flood control, hydroelectric power, drinking water, wastewater disposal, irrigation, simultaneously managed by independent agencies and without any consideration of the cumulative impacts on that single water resource and almost never thinking about have we protected the processes that maintain both the quality and the quantity of that water. And that's why it's called a crisis in management. So what we really need is a new management framework and what I call sustainable, ecologically, and watershed-based water resource management, where the goal is to identify a management framework for sustainable water resources, which is dependable resource in quantity and quality over the long term. And it's really, the key is the watershed, because previously, historically, we just managed water based on political boundaries, because we really couldn't see where the clouds ended. We didn't really think about where the water came from. And now we're focused on watersheds, and the watershed is the bowl. And when it rains, you only get the amount of water that you get in your bowl, and it's the lip of the hill, the hills that are the lip of the bowl. And that's now a whole different way to think about managing water and who your real important neighbors are, the ones that share the bowl with you. 
So now we're going to talk about natural watershed processes, those things that are the ecological processes we need to protect if we want to have sustainable water quality and quantity. So the bowl determines both the total amount of water that you have to work with. That's all you get, whatever falls in your bowl. But it also determines the quality. Because once the rainfall leaves the sky, and the rainfall is almost pure H2O, I mean, you can drink it, put your mouth in most places, it's drinkable. It comes down and it hits the surface of the earth. And there are two important processes. If the soil of the earth is compacted or even impervious, the water runs off the surface or in the shallow layers right below it, and that's runoff. And that moves down slope and ends up in our streams, our lakes, and ultimately into the ocean. But if the, if the soils are really permeable, very, have lots of pore spaces, the water doesn't run off, it infiltrates, it percolates down until it hits a hard surface like bedrock, and then it begins to fill up the pore spaces, and that's groundwater. But groundwater also moves sideways or laterally, it moves down slope, so to speak, and it moves down and also comes into our streams, our lakes, and eventually into the ocean. And since you only get a certain amount of water, that's basically a balance between those two processes. You either run it off or you send it down into groundwater, and it's what we do with the landscape that determines that balance. The last part of the whole hydrologic cycle is evaporation and transpiration, or evapotranspiration. And it's very critical, especially west of the Mississippi. But I'm not going to talk as much of, very much at all about that here because it's a whole other, we have limited time, that's a whole other issue. And that really drives the issues of drought and irrigation. All right, so let's look at that runoff piece. So what I've given you is actually a photo from Arthur Spurgeon from Earth from Above, and it basically shows a very nice watershed. There's the hill, and there's the surface water channel, the tributary network that water runs through. And up in the upper right corner is actually this, a plan view of a watershed. The red line is the watershed divide, and then what you're looking at is the stream channel network. And the ones and one, twos and threes and fours are actually a designation of order. Uh, from small to the largest streams, and when you first have a stream show up on a map, that's a first order, and this is a particular ordering system called the Strayler ordering system. So when two one or first order streams come together, you get a second order stream. When two second orders come together, you get a third order, and so on. And if you were to actually map the lengths of all those streams, what you would see is that first orders and second orders are about three quarters of the total stream channel network, and those are our headwaters. Right, and they're very important. All right, this uh, provides a nice segue to this issue of recently, what, um, the government put out some guidance for what, where the Clean Water Act would be applied, what was covered under our Clean Water Act for navigable waters. And because there was some confusion, it was causing a lot of delays in getting any kind of permitting done. And this new, the new rules, I understand you're actually going to have a whole seminar on this, but just in brief, it focused a lot on what are tributaries, what are adjacent waters, and emphasized that now we're making sure that the Clean Water Act applies to headwater streams. That's what I just described for you, the first and second order stream. It also includes perennial, intermittent, and ephemeral streams. And those are streams that don't always have flow in them all times of the year, but they have indicators of flow, like a bank, a very clearly defined, defined channel and bank. It also includes some other types of wetlands, those located in floodplains, and large areas like the prairie potholes, where there's a whole lot of um, ponds all together. All right. Thinking of focusing on just the surface water tributary network, we all know when it rains, you're by a stream and you watch it rise, and then it gradually the rain stops and it drops. And that's what you're looking at there is two photographs of the same location. And above that is a hydrograph. It's a plot of the height of the water in the stream over the course of about of a week. And it's around 0.5 feet high, and then it rains, and not surprisingly, the stream rises very quickly. And then it lasts for a little while, begins to drop. But during that rise, that's the runoff piece. That's, the, that's that first piece we talked about where it runs quickly down to the stream. But after the rain stops and the runoff begins to drop back down, the stream is still flowing, and sometimes for days, weeks, even months, and that's groundwater. It's also called base flow. It's a very critical part of our stream flow system. 
and some studies by the USGS and put out in a paper actually called um, Surface Water, Groundwater, a Single Resource. They looked around the whole country and figured out that basically about 54% of the flow on average in our streams across the U.S. is base flow or groundwater. That's how important groundwater is if you want to have intact streams. So under natural conditions, the northeastern United States basically looked like that photo, which was one large forested canopy. And so when it rains, what happens is those vegetated canopies intercept the rain and snow. You trap moisture up in the leaves and on the stems. They slow down how hard the water hits the ground and reduces erosion. And usually, or what used to have, there used to be deep organic soils. A lot of leaf litter had built up and decomposed. And so that's basically like a sponge, like a cellulose sponge. It helps to capture rainfall. It helps, it's very porous. It helps infiltration to occur. And so what it means is the balance of whether you have runoff or groundwater, when in our pre-development scenario with lots of canopies, we really didn't have much runoff. What we largely had was groundwater infiltration. But what's happened is over the past several hundred years, what we've done is changed that landscape. We got rid of the canopies. We actually eroded most of the soil organic matter away in most places. And then we covered the surface with impervious surfaces of rooftops and driveways and parking lots and roads. And so we shifted the balance so that very little water infiltrates, much less, and largely most of the water moves as runoff. But what that means is, not surprisingly, we've changed the hydrograph. So why not? I showed you. Because now, all right, pre-development is the red line. So when it rained, water level, water would come through the canopy, through the soils, and slowly move through the stream, largely as groundwater. Water level would rise, hold steady for a while, and then gradually drop back down. But there was still water in the stream. In that post-development scenario, what we've done is then all the water, or large parts of it, rush off the landscape as runoff. It gets to the stream much faster. The stream rises quicker and much higher. And so basically, you're seeing a little flood event occur because of what we did to the landscape. And then it rapidly dry, draws back down, and it goes much lower. And actually, it can dry out in places. And that's because you have a balance. You only have so much water coming into your watershed. And if you run it all off, there isn't groundwater to be recharged. There isn't groundwater to flow into the streams. And that's then you result in a stream that's dried out. And so the deal is that we are causing a lot of some of the flooding that we see in streams and some of the dry outs. And our water tables are lowing. And this is what humans have done. And actually, I view this as the good news because the fact is, oh, we caused that to happen. We can change how we manage our landscape. And we can shift this back, shift the balance back. On top of all of that, changes in the landscape, there have been unintentional land use impacts that actually enhance or contribute to flooding. And so as we think about this whole, this whole webinar is really about flooding in particular, when we clear away streamside vegetation, you get rid of the vegetation that would actually help to reduce flooding. The stems and leaves, when water levels rise, the stems and leaves of plants that grow next to a stream actually intercept the flow, they slow it down, it forms little eddies behind the stems, and actually it traps the water, slowing it down, and it reduces flooding downstream. Additionally, we've actually put all these things in the landscape so that if flooding does occur, our strategy for 100 years or longer has been we'll get rid of that flood water as quickly as we can. Let's straighten those rivers out and dredge them and deepen them and put levees next to them so the water will leave as quickly as possible. Wetlands, which would normally have captured and slowed and held the water, we actually drain them, largely to use it for agriculture, but we drain them and put tile drains in, those tubes sticking out in the left photograph. And so we actually take the water that's coming through the landscape and get rid of it as fast as we can. Now, in that kind of framework of what we've done to the landscape enters the issue of roadside ditches, which is I've been working on for now about a decade. And we've been asking the question, I have a whole team of people, I'll show you the list in a minute, of asking what role are these roadside ditches playing to, in the issue of flooding and droughts and water pollution. And we're talking about these depressions, somebody called them trenches, that are on each side of the road and which are go along wherever you have roads, that's where you have ditches, and highway guys 
put them there because you want the water to run off the road so we can get to work, which I really appreciate. It also keeps the road from freezing underneath so it doesn't crack and buckle as much. And that's their job. That's, they keep the road going so I, like, I get to work every day, which is a great thing. Just so you're aware of it, roadside dishes have gone with roads around the entire world. So I have hundreds of photos from all over the world. And the fact is, roads are affecting most of the world's eco ecosystems. 50% of the contiguous U.S. is within 382 meters of a road. The road density is worldwide or up to one kilometer per square kilometer of space. The bottom photo is actually from Ethiopia. And so roadside ditches are this ubiquitous feature that have been affecting um, our ecosystems, our water bodies, and water resources for almost a century. I've had the pleasure of working with a whole team of faculty, of graduate students and undergraduates for the past decade, and we keep growing and changing as we look at new dimensions of roadside ditches, and it's been a real pleasure to work with them, and they have listed them here. So far, we've actually worked now, I think we're up to nine separate watersheds across central New York. We usually do the same things. We start by mapping all the ditches within a given watershed. We match what the, map what the lengths are, uh, what the management types, whether they're scraped, exposed, rocks, we, and we map how they are connected to the streams. And then it depends on what our research question is, but we, we monitor. We use ISCO automated water samplers a lot of times that then can capture a storm right when it occurs. Uh, we look at the total water flow, the suspended sediment, various dissolved chemicals. We monitor, um, in some cases, bed load. And what bed load is is the stuff that's too heavy, the rocks and gravel that are too heavy to be sucked up into the ISCO sampler. They don't go up into the water column. They just bounce around the bottom. And so we have these little traps, like a pitfall trap they fall into, and we can monitor bed load. And then, depending on the research question, we do modeling to figure out, in this case, how all the different factors contribute to the hydrology of a given watershed. And it, that models how we upscale from the, sub, the ditches that we get to sample, there's many more ditches we can, and then we can upscale our work by using a model. This is a photo on the left of what a vegetated ditch looks like, and on the right is what you see when you see an exposed or scraped ditch. And as you're going to find out, this is a key difference in ditches management across the state and actually throughout the northeastern U.S. All right. When we map the ditches, you learn a lot about what's happening in the landscape. So the average across the watersheds we've looked at, on average, a watershed's about 16 square miles with 33 miles of road. The roads only account for less than 1% of the surface area. So when rain falls on the roads, it's only 1 in 100th of all the surface area. However, every road has ditches next to it, and so there's actually 52 miles of ditches, of which on average 32 are actually connected to streams. But those ditches dump into streams at 94 locations in every watershed. So it's not one place. It's the entire watershed has ditches dumping into the streams throughout. What's interesting is that the area of the basins that drain to the ditches, so the ditches don't just capture what comes off the road. They capture what comes off the hill next to the road. And on average, it's about 19.4%, 20%, one-fifth of each watershed has hill slopes or some basin that drains and gets intercepted by a ditch, okay, and then shunted to a stream. So what happens is you have a stream channel that's about, if you added up all the first, second, third, and fourth orders, is about 41 miles long, but when you, and that's a density of 1.55 kilometers per kilometer squared. But if you add all the ditches, it triples, doubles to triples that. And so what it means is the landscape is now much more interdigitated. There's more land, ways for land to connect rapidly to water. Viewed visually, in this slide, what you're looking at is the watershed for the Doolittle Creek in Cander, New York, and the blue line is the watershed divide around the outside of it. And then the dark blue line, you see the stream channel network in there, and the red line represents the roads that are going through it. And all the orange patches represent the basins that drain to the ditches. So on average, there's about 20% of that landscape is draining right to it a road into a ditch and shunt it sideways and down to another location in the stream channel. And so I can't point to it for you, but basically imagine one of those orange patches, when it rains, the water runs down the hill and would naturally keep on going until it hit the stream. It would move slowly and keep the stream flowing. Instead, it almost makes it to the stream, it hits the road, gets intercepted by the ditch, it gets shunted sideways, it ends up as a high-velocity faucet 
dumping into the stream. There's 94 locations on average. And meanwhile, the stream back there, that little first and second order stream, is largely dry most of the time. It doesn't receive the runoff, and it also doesn't get much groundwater contributing to it. So when we look at what the hydrology is, we actually found that e this is for Doolittle Creek <clears throat> after all of our monitoring. Each of those ditches captured on average about half the rainfall that fell into their ditch basin. And when we upscaled to the whole watershed, that amount of water coming from all the ditches represents 20% of the stream flow. And in a separate creek that we looked at in Payne's Creek, north of there near Ithaca, 22% of the flow in spring and almost one third of the flow in a summer event were all discharged from the ditches into the stream. We also modeled, um, we also did some work to see exactly how was that affecting the hydrographs, the stream hydrographs. And so we monitored, this is actually work of a PhD student, uh, Brian Buchanan, who did a superb job. And what he did was actually measure what was in the ditch, what was in the stream before the ditch came in, and then what was how much flow was there in the stream right after the confluence of the two, which is what this title of this talk is about. And what you see is a spring hydrograph on the left and a summer hydrograph on the right. The green line is actually the ditch flow. The solid blue line is the stream flow. And the dotted line is what happens when you put the two together. And so basically you're seeing that ditch discharges get increased peak flows, basically small flood events, on average about 78%, and sometimes up to as much as 300%. And so the ditch contribution, they come dumping into the stream as a high volume, high, very fast input, and it causes the stream to have much higher flooding. <clears throat> we also looked at what some of the things that move in streams. And so we put in our ISCO and actually sample the suspended sediment. This is across one storm event. And what you see is the line is the discharge, and each of those purple lines represents how much sediment was uh, in the bottles, and this is a photo of the bottles at the top. And not surprisingly, dep it depends almost totally on how much vegetation is in the ditch. And so if there's lots of vegetation, very little sediment moves out and into the stream, but the more exposed bottom or substrate there is in the ditch, the higher and higher the sediment loads. We could get into all the numbers, but we've seen as much as 50 milligrams per liter, very high, almost a chocolate milkshake. And so the ditches are a source of sediment if they're scraped. They are also a conduit of sediment if it's coming, depending on what the land use, use is that's adjacent to the ditch. And we are currently looking at how ditches actually can transform nitrate and do denitrification and potentially act as a filter. So not only are they moving water and causing flood effects, they're also moving a lot of different types of contaminants and affecting water quality. We've looked only, we've only done some studies so far on what kind of nutrients are moving, but the point I would make here is that we also pick up the ice or salts in early spring. This is really important if you're keeping track of some of the, what's happening, uh, some of the work coming about waters in the northeast of the United States from Dr. Sujay Kashaw. What we're observing is an increase in the salt content of streams, but also groundwater throughout the northeastern United States. And in part, it's due to the de-icers. And when we talk to highway guys, what they say is people don't tolerate slushy roads like they did 40 years ago. They want them totally clean. That means we have to use more salt, more sand, and, it's, and now it's showing up in our streams. Thank you. Okay, we were also interested about other types of contaminants. And so we decided to look at the issue of microbial contaminants. And so a lot of the, uh, the watersheds we work in, the farms are in the headwaters to the streams, those first and second order streams, sometimes miles away from a drinking water supply system way down the slope. So, and most times people don't even think about, oh, a farmer's working up there, perhaps he spreads manure. But we wanted to know what the role of the roadside ditches was in terms of the microbes that are in manure spread on farm fields. Uh, this was done by Kim Falbo as her graduate work, and we looked at seven uh, ditches of four watersheds, including three forested ones as kind of a reference or background, and four agricultural fields where there was manure spreading. And I live next to a farm, and I love, I love living next to a dairy farm. So it's a night, we view that as a green space in our landscape, but we also need to be thinking about, well, what happens and how does it affect our water quality? 
we were lucky because we actually had a simple method brought to us by um, Dr. Dan Buckley called the IDEX cold alert system. So basically, you just put the water sample over in this tray, let it incubate in a incubator overnight, and then it fluoresces and tells you a, a quantitative number for how many coliforms and E. coli were present in the water sample. And this is a plot of some of the data from one, one of the sites from over about a course of a year. The two red lines represent when manure is spread. And what you see is when manure gets spread, you in the ditch, we immediately start picking up very high concentrations, very high, well above any EBA standards of E. coli. The ditches dry out, but each time a storm event occurs, we continue to see E. coli moving through the ditches and all the way into the following fall. Most of these disappear over winter and it kind of resets, but then when manure spread again, it starts over again. And so the ditches are very rapid conduits. It moves within hours from these hill areas where they're spread and it moves down, down the ditches to the streams and then down to the, the lakes or where the drinking water supply systems are. The last piece I think I'm going to mention to you is this issue of bed load. And so what we have realized is there's a lot going on when that water looks muddy. Meanwhile, underneath, large amounts of gravel rocks are also bouncing along the bottom of the ditch, especially when they've been scraped. And that's the bed load. And what happens is it moves out of the ditch, and when it hits the stream, it drops and forms a delta. So what this means is in every watershed, there are like 94 locations where ditches dump into a stream, and it doesn't matter what the natural pattern of uh, meandering or flow is in the stream, these ditches just kind of randomly enter because it's not really on their agenda for the town highway staff to have to think about, oh, we're, what's happening in the stream? And so a delta forms, and the stream now has to go around it. And it's associated with a high-velocity faucet is the way I think of them, which is now squirting water in and causing some erosion on the other bank. And then the whole system has to re-equilibrate around that new source of this chronic bed load forming a delta. And so we believe, and we don't have as much data for this as we do for the other aspects, but we're pretty sure that basically these streams are in what I call chronic dis disequilibrium with a, now a storm-driven geomorphology, that the banks themselves are eroding a lot due to these ditch inputs. And so we haven't quantified this, but we believe a lot of the sediment that we see moving is because these systems are out of, out of equilibrium. Okay, so what do we show? One, that ditches intercept, capture, and shunt about 20% of runoff to streams. They contribute to flooding in the streams. They contribute to headwater streams drying out and probably lowering of the water table that we haven't quantitatively documented that. They are a rapid conduit and source of sediments, of pathogens, of de-icers and nutrients, and they're contributing to some degree to in-stream erosion and ecosystem degradation. What's interesting, with all of those impacts, they were not included under the new Clean Water Act definition. And a, if you read through it, you'll see that it excludes specifically ditches that flow after rain. They include some ditches that dump into tributaries, and in large part, we submitted our information when this analysis was being done. And I think it has a lot to do with the millions of miles of roadside ditches. And how would you even begin to manage them if they suddenly had to fall under the same uh, regulations that we do to protect our water? And so even though there's pretty good evidence they're contributing to the physical and chemical integrity and health of our streams, we haven't even gotten to the biology yet. It still, they don't currently fall under the Clean Water Act of um, part of the navigable waterways of the United States. Um, and they're kind of outside. They sit outside the system kind of the way a lot of the agricultural practices do as well. And so there's a real need to start looking at how we're going to better manage ditches and give the resources to town highway staff to do that. So we've been talking to highway guys for at least a decade, and they work very, very hard. Uh, we've made fact sheets, given presentations. And the word has gotten around. So we were invited in 2014 to give a conference for the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, to replumb the Chesapeake to meet TMDL goals. The recommendations and report from all of that were just released two weeks ago. And so that looks pretty strongly like there's going to be a real focus on doing a more holistic, integrated program to manage ditches, roadside ditches across the Chesapeake Bay. What do we tell, so what are we telling the highway guys? 
Basically, we want to replumb our watersheds to reduce floods, droughts, and pollution, and there's two overall approaches. One, we need strategies to disconnect ditches from the streams. We don't want the water racing away causing flooding, and we don't want the streams to dry out. And second, we need strategies to reduce the amount of sediment and contaminants moving to streams. So these are some examples. This first one is really the larger picture. We have to reduce the transfer of runoff from land to ditches, whether it be by tile drains or drains connecting houses to roads or even par parking lots. All that water, we really need to get it redirected back underground to start recharging our groundwater. We need to disconnect the ditches from the streams. And so if water were instead directed to infiltration basins, constructed wetlands, or detention ponds, that would allow groundwater recharge and prevent, reduce the amount of flooding in streams. We have to do quite a bit to stop the amount of pollution that's moving through the ditches, both as a source and a conduit. And so if we can increase the amount of mowing that happens instead of scraping, that would help a lot. And we're even getting more hydroceding immediately after the ditching. And so we've done a survey of the 999 uh, towns across New York State. We had a 40% return rate. And basically about half the ditches are scraped once every two to four years and the half are not hydroceded or revegetated at all. And so that means there are hundreds if not thousands of miles of ditches that sit exposed waiting for the next rain event. Another strategy, and one that I'm very concerned about, is avoiding these overly deep and V-shaped ditches. For some reason, I'm watching highway guys dig deeper and deeper ditches. They only need to be about 18 inches deep. The reason this is so problematic is the deeper you go, you're not just getting shallow, just the surface runoff, you're getting shallow lateral flow and moving into some of the groundwater. So you actually capture more water with a deep ditch, and that means more flow, more incision, more erosion. Check dams are great so far. I, I'm finding that they are a good strategy to slow down ditch flow, and we're now looking at bioretention swales. And there's not a whole lot of research and clear research documenting when to use these different strategies, how well they work, under what conditions they work. It was li listed as the top challenge for the entire Chesapeake Bay of um, professionals don't know when and where to use which strategy. So you kind of default back to, well, we scrape the ditches. And so we need to really get organized, as we've done with agricultural best management practices, and catalog them and provide guidance on when to use them. All right, the last section of this talk is going back upscale to the, global the national and global relevance of this issue. And what we need to do is really think comprehensively about how to buffer the impacts of climate extremes, focusing on flooding. First, we need to reduce our, not just the flooding occurrence, but our vulnerability to floods. Uh, one way we can do it is these headwater streams currently don't fall into the legal category. Of, well, they just changed that. That's right. They've just changed that, so now they will. But in general, in the past, you could clear vegetation right up to the edge of a first-order stream. They weren't legally wetlands based on the qualities of soil or flooding or vegetation. And so people totally cleared right up to the edge of the first and second-order streams. That means the headwaters, which were three quarters of the entire stream channel network, could be cleared out. And that means you wouldn't have the flood protection. It was really, it's really important that we improve how we protect our first and second order streams. And the Town of Ulysses has a stream protection ordinance for our first and second order streams. It works really well when it comes to any permitting for new housing. And it's a strategy to take. I don't work on culvert sizing. It's a huge issue. There's tons of information out there, but proper culvert sizing under roads is key. Not just sizing, but siting and how they're placed. And this photo shows an improper culvert where there's no way any fish could get up into that culvert. And so more can be done, especially because now with these increased size of storms, if the culverts are too small, you get overtopping, then you get erosion around the edge, you can wash out the whole road associated with it. So better culvert sizing will help to be more flood resilient. We should be looking at the whole watershed, and this is going back to the first things I talked about at the beginning of the talk. We, we've got rid of the forested areas in our catchments that used to capture rainfall. We need to retur return those. We need to restore and protect wetlands that can capture water, maybe getting rid of some of the tile drains. 
we need to increase the soil organic matter, and that's true here, very much true west of the Mississippi, but we have actually depleted organic matter. We have much thinner soils in the northeastern United States than we did about 150 years ago. And again, the ability of that soil to uh, allow water infiltration is much reduced. There's a real wonderful suite of agricultural BMPs, cover crops, um, contour buffers, all kinds of things that you can use to reduce runoff that help prevent flooding. And we, we are using those, more can be done. The EPA phase two stormwater regulations went into effect and are helping us to focus on replacing impervious surfaces and there's more and more green infrastructure to help with that. And then as we've just discussed, replumbing the roadside ditch networks. I want to mention this in detail just to remind you of these benefits because it's really important when I talk about the next point and that riparian zones, wetlands, stream sides, all of them provide numerous ecosystem services. Flood reduction is the one we're talking about, but they filter and improve both surface water quality and groundwater quality. Having plants next to the stream reduces stream bank erosion. Just having canopies over the first and second order streams, which are very narrow, like less than one yard wide in many places, shades and cools those streams, which is really important as air temperatures keep rising. And these are the areas when they're flooded that are nursery areas and refugia for fish. All of these ecosystem services you get back when you restore and protect riparian and floodplains. And so the deal is that we need to reduce vulnerability to flooding, but with more storms, more intense rainfall events, we're going to have more water moving through the rivers. It doesn't matter how well we improve the landscape. With, when you get 13 inches of rain, it's going to move across that system and the rivers are going to rise. And we want to get people less vulnerable. And so. Rivers are naturally dynamic. They move back and forth in their floodplain. And when humans put houses there, we want everything stabilized. But if you allow them to be dynamic, to move back and forth, that actually absorbs energy. Um, the plants can re grow rapidly right back and you get those ecosystem services. And so that's why I want to emphasize all those benefits because what we need to do is start getting people out of the highest risk flood areas. And we could talk about Katrina, Susquehanna. This is actually a map of what got flooded in 2006 along in Broome County, along the Susquehanna. The blue is uh, what was flooded within the 100 year floodplain and the darker blue is in the 500 year floodplain. And basically about 1200 different parcels, including ag, co commercial, homes, industrial, public services were all flooded during those events. We want to get people out from these high risk flood areas that not only put them at risk, that costs money, it puts emergency personnel at risk who have to go out and save people. And we lose all those ecosystem services. So in that same venue of what do we do with a floodplain to reduce risk and the cost and expense, we want to remove or upgrade vulnerable infrastructure. So this is actually the same Endicott sewage treatment plant along the Susquehanna River in June of 2006 and five years later in 2011 when it was flooded both times. And it's just a matter of when does the next flood come, what do we do? We need to start moving the infrastructure that we support with tax dollars or at least retro, retrofit them, upgrade them so that they're more flood tolerant. Buyouts and rezoning is the key part of all this. And so this is just a, an exercise I did with a class for a part of that Broome County area that was totally developed and got totally flooded. And what we said, what would you do? It was a, a class with landscape architects and engineers. And we said, that same area, if you rezoned it for three zones, one right next to the river that has restored the riparian forest, so again, for those ecosystem services, you could include trails and boat access. An intermediate zone that you would replace with parklands and playing fields. Again, very flood resistant if water comes in. And at the highest elevation, you could have some elevated, very flood proof housing that would overlook the park and river and have a lot of value. And so there are other ways to deal with our floodplain regions. They don't have to be totally developed. And when floods occur, the buyout uh, systems that both the federal, state, and local governments are using is a, a real powerful tool for helping to make communities more flood resilient. I didn't hardly talk about groundwater protection. If we were west of the Mississippi and, and really focused on drought, then I would have had a whole lot in this talk all about aquifers and groundwater protection, but we don't have enough time. But remember I said about half of the water in streams is base flow, which is from groundwater. 
and a big issue in the right now and coming decades is humans are turning more and more to groundwater as a, a theoretically totally resilient resource and dependable when rain stops coming. But if you lower the water table, what happens is your streams start to dry out, the soils dry out, there's tree dieback, and there's a lot of problems. So we can't overlook the need that you need to protect groundwater. So my take home message is that we need to replumb the watersheds because we have rainfall and then we have droughts. And particularly in like the example I used, if we save the rain when it comes, if we replumb our watersheds, we will actually have higher water tables. We will have water to use when we need it, when it gets a dry period. And so as we think about places where it alternates from floods to droughts, is it a calamity? Yes, it's definitely a disaster, but not if we get people, if we can reduce their vulnerability to risk, if we save the water when it comes, we can actually view it as an opportunity. And on a national level, water is a valuable resource. So in the Midwest, as areas become drier and agriculture declines, this was a New York Times article in 2014, the Northeast has water. People are going to rethink about where do we put agriculture, water intensive industry. And right now we throw away fresh drinkable water and we need to rethink how we deal with climate change, these increased rainfall events, how we manage our landscapes and view this as a, something we really need to put our attention to. And that's it. And I thank you. Any questions? No questions so far, but uh, we'll wait about a minute or so if anyone has any questions that they'd like to enter into the chat box. So our first question, uh, Department of Public Works tend to be resistant to pervious pavement. How can we convince them to pay the extra cost to install these structures? Okay. It costs money to do all these things, pervious payments, to replumb these ditches. We've done an uh, environmental engineering analysis of what it costs to uh, put pipes under roads, to put <clears throat> infiltration basins in. Right now, when water is almost free, it's so cheap that people don't think of it as, a, as something valuable, then it's very difficult to convince people, oh, we need to be doing a better job. But as I said, Arguably, people are starting to recognize water is a limiting resource, not energy. And so when the West is drying up and sees that we have water and water can be viewed as an economic opportunity, suddenly doing a better job with how we manage the water, it's going to be translating into money to do better, like green infrastructure. There's more green infrastructure money. And so it's a, I think it's a whole change of mindset that's been um, in, made more rapid because of climate change. Um, I think it's going to come about. You know, the same thing with the roadside ditches. They've been doing it a certain way for 100 years, and they're, it's hard to get them to change practices. But as these issues of water scarcity, water pollution, flooding become more and more real, people would then start thinking, oh, well, maybe we need to compromise and change our policy. So I think it's a coming. We just need to keep educating people. Uh, second question, what type of stream protection or ordinance does the town of Ulysses have? All right, so we put it in place almost a decade ago, and basically because there was no laws protecting first and second order streams or ephemeral streams, we actually put in a rule that says you cannot develop within 25 feet of the edge of a first or second order stream that shows up on the USGS topographic map, and you have to restore the vegetation if you clear it. So we're the whole goal of it is to keep vegetation right along the stream sides in the smallest headwater streams. Why it's so effective is, I actually serve on the, the planning board, if there's a rule in place, when people come in to ask for a permit to do any kind of changes to their home or build a home, oh, they already know, okay, we know we won't be within 25 feet of the headwater stream. And so it's kind of, it's kind of a very easy, they don't even question it. There's the rule, we follow it. Whereas if there's no rule, you have to kind of encourage them, entice them, ask them not to develop right up to the edge of this very tiny one, you know, three foot wide creek. So having it in place has been really, really useful. Do you have any municipalities that have bought in on transforming their ditching practices as you have suggested? We have, okay, we've done a survey of those, as I mentioned, in 2014 in the town highway staff across the state, and we're really tickled that 
those who have attended the conferences where we've presented have bought into how important this is. And there, there's an increased awareness and increased willingness to try and to work on this. We've had towns who have uh, agreed to make differences, but not, but we see small changes, not big changes. Um, more hydro seeding is happening because of this, especially um, more hydro seeders are being bought and shared among different soil and water districts. So we're seeing definitely more revegetation re occurring. It's not happening as quickly as we'd like, and so what the challenges are we get when we ask the town highway guys are multiple. One, town highway staff work with very tiny budgets. They are limited on funding, on manpower, on equipment. Like if they can't get access to a hydro seeder, what do they do? And fourth, actually in New York State, the town, um, the landowner owns a road to the middle of, of the town road. Okay, if your property is along a town road, you own right to the middle of the road, and then the town highway staff has a right of way to work on the ditch. But technically, it's not their property; it's yours. People don't like them to come in and start digging and reshaping, maybe widening them, flattening them, taking more of their lawn. So they view it as we're not going to be, in, you know, interfering with these people's lands. And we need an education program really to go out to landowners to get them to understand how important this is, issue is for water resources. And then they'll be more likely to work with the town highway staff and vice versa. Where are organic soils sourced to help manage roadside ditches? Does it come from the DOT municipalities or both? And is there research on this? Wait, organic soils for the roadside ditches? So the organic soils, let me think a minute. All right, so when I was talking about organic soils, I was talking more about the whole landscape, that when it rained and it hit the soil surface, like on a hill, if there was organic matter on the hill, it would be more likely to infiltrate. And the reality is in New York State, and particularly out west, like if you think Dust Bowl or Black Sunday during the Dust Bowl, when all the organic matter blew or washed away, that's what's happened globally, where we've reduced the amount of organic matter across the entire landscape. Ditches are interesting because they're scraped, and so they, many places, hit mineral soil or even bedrock. And so you'd have to, right now, we'd have to actually reconstruct these ditches with like a, something like a bioswill, where we add back soil, add then, like you say, mulch or organic matter, and it's a resource. You're right. Where would they get it? Where would they get the mulch? And it costs money. And so, um, a lot of like ground up wood chips and you can is available. I mean we have a lot of forest still here. There's materials that could be available and town highway guys routinely collect wood along the roads. I mean they have piles of wood chips to work with. But there's no real there's not as much adoption of bioswales and organic like um media being put back in dishes as we're hoping to get in the future. So it's not really well worked out yet. Are check dams and bioswales the only methods to disconnect ditches from streams? Okay, no. So we've, Dr. David Orr at the Cornell Local Roads Program is great, and we work through all the possible strategies. We actually have a, a small fact sheet on this. <clears throat> there are under, and then the Center for Dirt and Gravel Roads in Pennsylvania is, is superb as well. So there are under drains you can put under road at pace like every 50 to 100 yards along a a road so the ditch actually doesn't go all the way down to the stream. It periodically discharges into a tube under the road which goes back down slope back to the stream. All the way to, you can have ditches go into infiltration basins. You can have them dump into detention ponds, stormwater basins they're called, some of them, or a constructed wetland. And that way the water again doesn't go to the stream. It goes into like a holding place where it gradually infiltrates or at least, get, and sometimes filtering occurs. So there's a range of options. They vary in cost. Uh, you mentioned Ulysses local law protection primary and secondary streams. Uh, did I hear you indicate that there's, a, there's now either state or federal protection of these streams? So the new de definition of what's covered under the Clean Water Act Specifically now, they explicitly wanted to include first order, second order, headwater streams. I don't know all the details of the new ruling, and, so, and I'm learning about policies that affect ditches, so I can't, I think next week's webinar will probably give you more details.
but in theory, it should now have better protection for first and second order headwater streams through the new ruling. And that that webinar will occur uh, the first Thursday of May, so two weeks from now, at one at the same time, one o'clock. I'll be listening in. You mentioned as a management measure to disconnect ditches from streams. Where do the ditches drain then? Well, that's what we were just talking about. If you can divert them to an infiltration basin, that means the infiltration basin is like captures it before the water would end up in the stream. She also commented that we answered her question. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Okay, are there any other questions? All right. Thank you everyone for joining in. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the slides and the recording of this webinar will be available on our website, efc.syr.edu. And I hope to see everybody at the second and third part of this webinar series. So thanks for tuning in and have a good afternoon.